getting it right. Uh, Rumi, a few hundred years ago, he was like in the 1300s, he said, there is a field out beyond right and wrong. I'll meet you there. <laughs> and so as we think about right, uh, sometimes we can get hung up on that because we have to say, well, what is right? So that leads perfectly into today's talk because this year we've been talking about having a grand rising. And this month, you know, when the front of the magazine, you see this beautiful cover, um, and oh, it's up above too. Um, so it's called Shaking Up or Unstatus Quo, Shaking It Up. And I want to talk a little bit about who is other? Uh, why do we other? <laughs> it's a verb now, we're othering. Um, and then how do the tools of science of mind assist us in moving beyond? Well, our meditation this morning was about oneness, so we've already got a hint uh, of how we might go about doing this. So this cover, of course, as you can see, on the whole thing, you can't quite see it on the slide, but on the whole thing, it's this picture of this beautiful sunset or sunrise, can't tell, with a crystal ball in front of it which reflects the light perfectly upside down. Mm -hmm. So you might say, well, the status quo is the world as we see it, so we could just flip it over. But what do you notice? Anyone notice anything about that, flipping it over? Yeah, I mean, it hasn't changed really. There's still the stratus, the same kind of layering, uh, the same people are next to each other. So you really haven't shaken it up all that much. Now, when I was a kid, I don't know if they still make them, the things you shake up and you know, the snow falls down. For a little while, it's great, but heck, gravity comes along and all the snow falls to the ground. But that's kind of a no more mixing, a more shaking it up. So when we talk about the status quo, how many of you know the whole you know, sentence that goes along with status quo? Most of us don't, right? I had to look it up. And, but it's come to be used in the English language as, well, the way it is, the norm. All, as you look out, this is it. This is the status quo, and we're, you know, I'm pretty happy with it. I'm comfortable. I don't have to change too much. But the truth is, everywhere we go, we see change. We see difference. And we've been taught this since we were little, at least I, I was. I don't know about you. So let's see if I can make sure that I'm uh, on track here. From this perspective of looking out, uh, I'm little and I'm thinking, well, there's other little people, but there's a lot of these big people. That's different. And you notice the people around you, and you, you notice the people at school, and different things. You notice we had a black and white television, one channel, KTWO, <laughs> coming to you direct, 1400 on your dial. Um, <laughs> as we embrace this, we look out and we say, I will do a quick change of, but doesn't mean, oh, Chris, then I can't wander around. Let's see, I'll do it anyway. So as we look out, uh, we saw differences around us, and that led us to believe that there is otherness, uh, because people weren't the same as I was. Uh, families weren't the same, surprisingly. And uh, if we look out, we say, uh, this next uh, slide, uh, there's a little image. And you look at this and you say, well, when I see this, I'm viewing it from my perspective, my own experience, my set of beliefs. And so I look at it, and, w and you consider the image. You know, A clothesline uh, on the side yard, you can see it from the street. And what comes to mind? Anyone want a popcorn uh, uh, a, a sentence or a phrase or a word? 1955. 1955. Uh, I was thinking 
60s. Okay, so now there's temporal uh, uh, thinking uh, going on. Yeah. Fresh smell. See. Diapers. So, see, we're obviously noticing that there were times when we've seen this. I, I saw another hand. Loving family. Loving family. There you go. There you go. Because when you think about it, uh, there's about 130 million households in the United States. And of those, uh, oh, great. Yay. 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 70% of them have, have dryers. Uh, and then another bunch of them living in apartments or something like that, they might have a, a washer dryer down in the basement. And then some people use a laundromat um, and some people wash the clothes and then take them and, and hang them up to dry. Um, so it's still happening. You might, might think, oh, is there some uh, reason can't afford a dryer? Is, is the electricity off? Uh, is this actually an au pair that's helping out? Uh, you know, what kinds of stories do we make up when we see an image? What memories does it jog, diapers, uh, and the love of family, being taken care of them by carefully placing them out on the line with just the right, you know, sheets in front to block, you know, to make sure that there isn't any unseen. <laughs> so in your mind, in my mind, I can make up all sorts of uh, little vignettes just from this single image. And we had this notion that the internet would connect all of us. And in connecting all of us, then we would be able to share stories, and then I would hear your story, you would hear my story, and over time we would get to realize each other as not quite as other as we thought. Well, the internet hasn't lived up to its promise. Instead, it's created, in fact, <coughs> perhaps more bubbles than we had anticipated. So this next image shows you <coughs> one dimension of otherness. There's 193 countries recognized by the UN, and these are their flags scattered around. Uh, it turns, if you, if you find it online, you can see it. You can, so you can see all the flags of, and of course in some places there's a lot of flags, and in some places there's a few flags. So that creates a certain uh, national otherness. Uh, you know, I'm from the United States of America. You know, so uh, that has a certain role in the United S in, in the world today. Uh, another country, like a large country like China or India, within that one flag is hundreds of dialects, different groups, different towns that they can hardly speak together. So they have a common language that is the official language, but in their day-to-day -day use, they might actually speak another another tongue. So language can be something uh, that separates us. But there's all sorts of dimensions. We can think of them all, right? You know, the, your height, uh, your skin color, um, even what you like to cook, the spices you use. If you've ever lived with someone who is, uses a lot of spice, I'm a spice user. And so depending, I, I can walk in after I've been cooking, I come right in and I say, oh, I, I remember I was doing Italian tonight. <laughs> So you can smell this, the differences from different people's choices. There's, of course, identity, there's finance, there's socioeconomics, any number of things that we're taught to look at. There's an organization called World Work, and they worked with others. So one of their famous case studies is working with two Christian groups, but they were in Ireland. And so one group, of course was Catholic, and another cr group was the Church of England Protestant, and as they tried to understand why do they have such a challenge being with each other. And of course this was during the times of the troubles and bombings, and so these people were not exactly f on good speaking terms. So world work came in with their process 
and people, someone makes a statement. And then people that agree with that come and stand close, and their closeness to it says how much do they agree with that position. And then someone, rather than saying, no, not that, has to make another affirmative statement about something else because not everyone was able to stand over there. So little by little, they found all of these things that people could affirm and things that were different about them, and they began talking. Remarkable. We have a teen group here in town called the Launchpad, and this fall, they're starting out and they're gonna do dinners where a, teen, a couple of teens join with members of the community. You can sign up, by the way, to become one of the dinner attendees, and they're gonna have difficult conversations about the things that normally we don't talk about. Now, this next uh, little image, some of you may uh, remember. Pogo, anyone? So uh, they were on an exploration and they came across this dump and they're walking across it and uh, they had had to go across and it was sharp and there was probably rusty nails and, and I said, whoa, this is hard walking on this stuff. And he says, yep, son, we have met the enemy and he is us. So remarkably, when we look out and we try and say, who is other, we have to stand to the other side and also say, but wait, no, you are other. Because depending on our viewpoint, we have a different view. But this is a very wise thing to remember is that I am my own us. I am my own other. Because not always do I agree with myself. Now, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Did you mean that to be rude? <laughs> no, 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 it was just a joke. Uh-huh. So you have to worry about this if you like to worry. However, another approach when we think about me being my own other is that, well, aren't I supposed to be my own cheerleader? Shouldn't I love myself? How can I expect anyone else to love me if I don't love me? So by looking at it from that perspective, I can say that now I'm in an easier place. I can make decisions from an easier place. I can act from a kinder, more compassionate place because, oh wait, that might be me I'm talking about. So Ernest Holmes said in The Art of Life, all human endeavor is an attempt to get back to first principles, to find such an inward wholeness that all sense of fear, doubt, and uncertainty vanishes. That's what I want. All sense of fear, doubt, and uncertainty vanishes. So how do we get there? Everyone wants it. Ernest Holmes told us. So in our hearts, if we notice that oneness, if we notice that we're a part of the, this whole, then we can feel better about ourselves and what we have in the past perhaps labeled other. So there was this uh, teaching of Abraham. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the teachings of Abraham. And one of the things she liked to say is, well, you're not looking at it from far enough away. <laughs> if you've ever looked in the mirror and say, oh man, I can't believe it. What the heck are those wrinkles? Well, just step a little further back. <laughs> no wrinkles now. The earth looks very uh, smooth and easy from space. You don't see all these flags flying. So this next question is, if we know this, we know about oneness, then why do we other? Anyone have a thought? Why? Why do we other? Fear. Fear. Yeah. Comparison. We're not acknowledging the paradigm that we're one. So our minds look to separate and to find um, Difference. differences. So did we make that up ourselves? 
No. Typically, when we're just little tiny babies, actually we think the whole world is us. We haven't even quite figured out the, that this thing that's moving over here has anything to do with me. Oh, wait. So we other because we've been taught to do it. So we listen to conversations over the dinner table when we were kids. We went to play school and we saw differences. And people pointed out things that were different. Maybe in just side comments. But little kids, have you noticed? They listen to all the side comments. In fact, sometimes the side comments are more important than the thing that they're telling you. Because I told you, that's why. <laughs> now, OK, well, I'm going to not be so sure about that one. <laughs> so when we look out as a, as a youth, when I, I thought of it, I was thinking, well, everyone must be like our family, until I started going to other people's homes. And you walk into their house, and you realize, oh, they don't use their living room. That's like off, off limits, you know? The, the ones that you're really not so sure about, if they have plastic covers. <laughs> they're rare now, they're rare now, right? That was so town and country. But often the act of othering is rooted in fear. The fear of separateness, the fear of not being good enough, the fear of not measuring up. All of these things can lead us to say, hmm, someone else might be judging us. Why? Well, because I'm judging others, then I assume that others are judging me. So I better get in the first punch and I'm going to be kind of rude. You know, well, that's a downhill slope if you want it, right? Because othering engenders othering behavior. Now, Ken Wilber, how many of you heard of Ken Wilber? He's an in integral theory and a transpersonal psychologist. And he wrote a book now, years ago, called No Boundary. And in that No Boundary, he said, it's right shortly after birth that we as children uh, infants really, recognize that we're different than mom, different than the room around us, different than our caregiver. We actually aren't connected and that's our first boundary that we create. And then layer upon layer, bubble upon bubble, ring upon ring, we create these boundaries. That's his theory. And his integral theory is we want to undo that, much like here in Science of Mind, we want to replace that idea with wholeness, oneness, perfection, not perfect like in, you know, nothing wrong, always right, but perfect in the sense that it is complete, it is whole, it's integral. And so he looked at and said, how do we have this oneness? We recognize I am. So you have to have an awareness of self. And then I am, so you must be also an I am. From your perspective, I say you are, but not from your perspective. And this we are, the collective we, can help to embrace that if we can start to share the message that if we think of ourselves together, then things go a lot smoother than if we're having to fight or defend or make someone wrong and prove that I, after all, am right. Because being right doesn't always pay off as well as we think. We think, oh, I'm gonna feel really good. I'm gonna get a zinger in here and because I'm right but you do that and then you go oh actually it doesn't feel that good so maybe that's not the approach so we create this world around us that we label there's a chair these are stairs you know I'm wearing blue why do we do that well if we didn't we'd be overwhelmed our senses would be overwhelmed if at every moment we have to go Oh, wait, what is this thing that I'm supposed to do? Oh, that's right, it's a chair. We label it to make it convenient. 
But of course, that can lead to being losing conscious awareness, not being mindful. And we go on autopilot. My car knows exactly where I'm going when I get in it. It guesses and says, oh, you're going to the store. It's that time. Oh, you're going to, this morning it said, oh, you're going to the spiritual center for spiritual living. And it's seven minutes away. So this autopilot that we have is great for many things, but it's not so great for othering. So Ernest Holmes was able to say, practically the whole human species is hypnotized because it thinks what somebody else told it to think. Very interesting. Ernest Holmes, you don't usually hear him speak speaking in, in this way, but he wanted to state that so that he says, now, I don't expect you to believe what I'm saying. What I want is for you to experiment with these tools, try them yourself, and if they don't work for you, come back, let's talk about it, and we'll see whether or not we can apply the tools in a new way, or for you, we need something different. Because we have a number of tools to use and not all of them work for every situation. So this morning we had a wonderful meditation and that's a tool to help get us connected and grounded, go inside, hear that small voice which is often saying, there is no other, there is no other, there is no other, if you listen. It might say it a different way, it might say there's only one, there's only one. Uh, so from my earliest memories, I assumed there's that assumption thing. I assumed everyone thought like I did. Because here, what do I know any different? So when I'm in a room and uh, I, I don't understand something, I say, whoa, wait, what did you mean by that? And so I was one of the kids that raised my hands. Even in grad school, you know, I thought, oh no, I'm in real trouble. For the first half of the semester, I'm the only one asking questions, you know. And I'm thinking, oh, the midterm's coming up. What's going to happen? Well, it turns out asking questions was a good thing because it meant that I understood what was needed because I asked. But if you don't ask and you make these assumptions, then what happens is that you misunderstand, you miss the point, and therefore you can miss the whole interaction. So what are our steps to oneness? I made this little slide, you know, walking up the steps, but where does it start? Well, first we have to be aware that we're even doing the othering thing. You have to know and you have to recognize the way you do it, not the way I do it, not the way it's done everywhere else. Each of us has our own. But once we become aware of it and we're mindful, now we can actually do something about it and we can say, oh, I can have compassion for myself because Guess what? The person over here doesn't think the way John does, and they might be othering me and saying, boy, that guy, I don't know, he's not really talking the way I talk. So if we become aware, then we can open the door to compassion, to empathy, to connecting with the other people, the other people, see? There you have it. It's the people that aren't me, and be able to recognize how I might be showing up in their movie. So as we move ahead, we can move forward and the one that works for me a lot, of course, meditation, visioning, journaling, but I go to treatment. The five-step affirmative prayer, we heard an invocation this morning from Sharon, and many of you have experienced <laughs> treatment if you've come to the three-minute miracle, uh, but it's a way that was designed to say, if you follow these five steps, then it's amazing what can happen. Now, with the kids, we made it a little simpler, you know, because it's R-U-R-T-R, -R, you know, recognition, unification, realization, thanksgiving, release. Wow, that's a lot to remember. But we can just say God is. God is the only thing that's going on. There's only one thing, this one power, this one presence. It's everywhere, it's every when. God is. 
And since God is everywhere and everywhere, and there must be that I am, you are, we are, everyone on the planet is part of that one thing, God, power, presence. So God is, I am. And what I know is that despite any otherness that is going on, you know, where you choose to seat, sit on a Sunday, I'll give you guys a homework a little later. <laughs> the way that you show up, the clothes that you wear, the way that you speak, whether you look directly at a person or you look down, all of these things are behaviors that make you a unique expression. So I know that each of us unique expressions, not same, not same in oneness, but unique, perfect, whole. And then I'm just grateful, I'm thanks, I give thanks. And many people said, if you just go to step four and give thanks, that's enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because I am giving thanks for the world, for me in it, and all of the myriad people that I get to run into throughout my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And because this is true, then I can say these words are powerful. These words are spoken through me, as me, but they're not necessarily my words because there's only one thing. And that one thing is speaking through me, so it must be powerful. And the law says, your words are powerful, and as you speak, so shall it be. And then you just say, and so it is.